for the lecture, we have a wonderful speaker today, Meredith Weaver. Uh, and so Meredith completed her BS in physics and astrophysics at the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities in 21, where she was the project manager of the Impress CubeSat mission. She just started her second year as a UC Berkeley physics graduate student, where she now works on solar flare high energy research at the Space Sciences Lab, including the development of the GRIPS High Altitude Balloon Project with advisor Pascal St. Hilaire. Um, and tonight she'll be telling us all about space weather and the GRIPS High Altitude Balloon. So please, Meredith, take it away. Hi, everyone. I'm Meredith. Thank you, Daniel, for the introduction. Um, I am here to talk about space weather and the GRIPS High Altitude Balloon, which is, this is GRIPS, and the balloon that it flies on is way up there, um, which might be a little different from balloons that you're used to seeing or thinking about, um, but we'll get to look at that a little bit closer later. Um, so I'm going to start the talk kind of by introducing the sun and what kind of radiation the sun puts out and how that can affect Earth. And then at the end of the talk, I'll talk a little bit about GRIPS and the upcoming mission. Um, but we can have questions at any point during the talk. Feel free to raise your hand. Um, and I think we'll get started. So I think my introduction pretty much summed it up. But I do have a slide about me. I think it's um, kind of nice for those younger folks in the audience to know how one gets up here. Um, so I became interested in space because my dad came to a lot of events like this. Uh, he's a hobbyist astronomer. He teaches physics at my high school. Um, and he took us to a lot of observatories and museums and such on family vacations growing up. Um, this is us at the Lick Observatory a couple weeks ago. So still going strong. <laughs> um, so like Daniel said, I did my undergrad at the University of Minnesota, not far from where I grew up. And I um, worked on the Impress and Exact Cube satellite missions there. So um, this picture right here of the CubeSat, it looks like a shoebox. That's why it's called a CubeSat. Um, and this is what kind of got me interested in working on instrumentation. I realized working on this project and in another internship I had that I didn't really want to just sit behind a computer and write code all of the time. I like to use electronics and work my, with my hands a bit more. Um, so that's what took me to Berkeley and the Space Sciences Lab because way up at the top of the hill above the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, better lunch patio. Uh, <laughs> there is um, this wonderful laboratory where a lot of instruments, a lot of famous uh, satellites have been built. So things like uh, Parker Solar Pro most recently is one of the big names. And coming up the COSY um, spectrometer mission uh, is being built at SSL. There are also smaller missions like GRIPS and other balloon projects. So lots of exciting stuff. And I am going into my second year as a graduate student. So, all right, what is space weather? What do you guys think space weather is? What do you think about? Yeah. Um, I guess events like um, solar storms of like charged particles. And so there's that. And then also, um like the odd comet or hmm. or thing or gas or gas clouds or nebulas or things like that. Okay, so I'm hearing uh solar storms and also maybe um events from further out in space could affect um space weather. Okay. Any other thoughts? Things that are related? Yeah. Dust? Dust or tiny rocks? Oh, yeah. Um, there is a lot of dust around the sun in our solar system. There's a lot of meteors. That could be. That could be space weather. So you think about a meteor shower. That would be something to look out for if you were a satellite out in space. Um, yeah, for sure. The aurora borealis. The aurora borealis, yes. Yep, that's a good one. Anything else? All right, cool. Well, yeah, great ideas. Um, so when I talk about space weather and space weather as a field is usually meant as near Earth, so in our solar system. Obviously, there's a lot of other events that cause weather elsewhere in the universe. But for today's talk, we're really focusing on what's happening in the solar system. And that uh, weather is caused by the sun. So as I'll get to in a little bit more depth, 
the sun is always blowing out this wind or a steady light rain of charged particles that hit the planets, asteroids, satellites, anything that's out in our solar system. So this can be dangerous for astronauts. It can be dangerous for electronics. Um, and we'll get to look at that in a little bit. But that's this is kind of how you can picture it. This is a normal day out in space. Sometimes there are more interesting events like this picture of the sun. We see a couple bright spots and this kind of arm of plasma coming off of the sun. Um, and of course, aurora borealis. So these things, these charged particles, events that are happening on the sun can create things like the northern lights, the aurora borealis around Earth. So great uh, topics. All right, so some of you are like, might be like, what is a charged particle? What are we actually talking about here? So let's break it down. Um, the charged particles I'm talking about in terms of the sun are mostly protons and electrons because if you think about hydrogen atom, we have one proton as the nucleus and we have one electron. And the typical way we think about atoms when they are bound is with an electron kind of orbiting around its nucleus. And you can think of an, um, a hydrogen gas making up most of the sun. There are some heavier elements that are being produced through fusion, but it's mostly hydrogen. Um, if you heat this hydrogen gas, kind of like boiling a pot of water and it turning into water vapor, the gas turns into ionized gas, which is known as plasma. So that is essentially what the entire sun is. And what happens when you heat the hydrogen gas is this nice orbit of the electron around the nucleus sort of gets broken down. And now the proton and the electron can move wherever they want to in a weird soup of charged particles. And that's how you can think of a plasma. So for all intents and purposes, it acts a lot like a fluid. And we'll get to that a little bit later. Any questions? So the other side of radiation coming from the sun is the electromagnetic spectrum. So uh, I hope most of us have seen, Pink Floyd taught us that um, if you put white light through a triangular prism, the different wavelengths that make up that white light are all the colors of the rainbow, and they travel at different speeds through the prism, which actually means that when they come out the other side, they're all in different places. So you can see just all of the different wavelengths of visible light that our eyes can see. But beyond that, there are a lot of other wavelengths of light that interact with our daily lives that our eyes just aren't attuned to, but we can build instruments that can see them. So things like radio waves are used to broadcast radio and television. We use microwaves to heat up our food every day. There's infrared radiation, which is the heat that comes off of our bodies. It comes off of the sun, it comes off of space heaters in our apartments, et cetera. And right in the middle is our visible light. Um, and we'll see later maybe a reason why visible light is the kind of light we can see with our eyes. Um, going up the scale, we have UV that burns our skin from uh, the sun, passes through our atmosphere far enough to do that. X-rays, which doctors use to look at bones. TSA uses to find the peanut butter in our bags that we forgot. Um, and gamma rays are the highest energy waves of light um, that sometimes are used in medicine actually to treat cancer. And this is also the kind of radiation that comes from cosmic rays. So we had someone mention maybe there's weather from cosmic rays. That's a little bit true. And that's the gamma rays. So the last sort of intro slide is to get familiar with our sun and what kind of, what is our sun made out of? What are the layers? Just like earth has a core, and a couple surrounding layers, so does the sun. And these layers aren't visible, just like they're not visible on Earth. We had to learn about them through uh, monitoring sound waves, sort of like seismology here on Earth. Same thing can be done with the sun. Um, but down in the core of the sun, there's fusion happening. So basically these atoms are hydrogen mostly, are compacted really tightly together. So they actually start to combine and form heavier elements, yes? Sorry, this might be a derail, but how can you use sound waves to study something that's in space? 
Great question. Um, so sound waves to study something in space. I did kind of just throw that out there. <laughs> it's if you're observing the sun, you can actually see wave patterns in sort of like the surface of the plasma. And those wave patterns are um, they have certain modes. <laughs> so they have like um, certain energies that tell us about what kind of layers that radiation that those waves have passed through. So if it's a certain energy um, sound wave that we can see using certain uh, specialized instruments, then um, it'll tell us if it passed through a layer from less dense to more dense, et cetera. And you can kind of do some triangulation to figure out how thick those layers are. I'm not a helioseismologist, but I think it's a really cool field. <laughs> you have questions? Well, I would know that don't sponges need air to move, but there's no air in space. They need a medium to move through. And we're talking about sound waves moving through the sun. So their their medium, the air that they're moving through is the plasma oh. of the sun. Yeah, but that's a great point. Yeah. Okay. So getting to the layers we see with our eyes or with specialized instruments that can look at other wavelengths like UV and X-rays and gamma rays. Um, let's start with the photosphere. So the photosphere is what we normally call the surface of the sun. I'll probably use those terms interchangeably throughout the talk. Um, what the photosphere is, it's not really a surface like we stand on on the surface of the earth. It's not solid, but we call it the surface because it's the area where the sun gets optically thick, which just basically means we can't see through it. Um, kind of like we see through the atmosphere, but we can't see through the ground. Same idea with the photosphere of the sun. On the photosphere, um, you can see sunspots. So if you've ever looked through solar eclipse glasses or any telescope that looks at visible light using just an attenuation filter, so it basically filters out 99% of the light coming out um, so that you don't burn your eyes, um, that's what we can see sunspots with. So maybe some of you have seen that before. I highly recommend getting yourself some eclipse glasses if you haven't. Um, Above the photosphere is the chromosphere, which is like the lower part of the atmosphere of the sun. And this is where you'll find um, prominences, these sort of loops of plasma. In the first picture of space weather, I had one that had a larger arm of plasma coming out. That's mostly where uh, these things are taking place. Also solar flares, which I'll get to later in the talk. Above that is the corona, which is the extended atmosphere of the sun. So it gets much less dense, it goes very far out away from the sun, and it's very hard to observe because it's much less bright than the surface of the sun. So a lot of solar physicists get excited when there's a total solar eclipse because it's a great time to see the corona. When the whole light of the sun is blocked, you can see this sort of diffuse um, material floating around. Uh, okay. Any questions about this one? Yeah. So you use the word atmosphere. Yes. I understand atmosphere of the Earth as air, mm -hmm. but what is the atmosphere of the sun? Another great question. So the corona is essentially just more plasma. It's made out of charged particles, but they're much further apart than they are when they're actually in the photosphere and below. Um, yeah, good question. Yes. Are you going to mention at all temperatures of like the corona because that it's extremely hot, right? Rel more so than the surface of the sun, which seems really odd. And I, my curiosity is, I think they debate a long time why that is. Is that still an unknown at this point in time? It's um, partially known. Um, again, not my area of expertise, but yeah, one really interesting quirk of the sun is that the surface, the photosphere, is about six thousand Kelvin while the corona can get to millions of uh, millions of Kelvin. Mm -hmm. So how is it that something closer to the nuclear fusion can be cooler than something that's further out? That seems very strange. Um, part of it can be heating from events on the surface of the sun, like flares, which I'm going to introduce next. Um, but there's a lot more that goes into it. And unfortunately, I'm not the expert. So I don't want to speak to all of that right now, but that is a yeah 
a really interesting thing about the sun to learn more about. Anything else? Yeah. So what fuels the sun and why does it keep on going? Why does the sun keep on burning? Yeah. You could say. <laughs> um, so the sun is constantly fusing together hydrogen atoms into heavier elements. So it will continue to do that until it basically runs out of hydrogen or the elements that it's producing in the center get too heavy to actually support themselves. So the sun, when I say support themselves, um, and all stars work by balancing the gravity of all of their material with the pressure of the radiation that they're producing. So all the light that the sun is producing actually produces enough pressure to balance the gravity of that material kind of collapsing in on itself. And when you get a lot of heavy materials like iron in the core, um, that balance gets pushed out of whack and you go towards something like a supernova or um, other, it doesn't always have to be a supernova, but other phases of the star's life. So good question. Uh, yeah. Can you explain plasma for some of us who are not? Yeah. Know? Yeah. So plasma, you can think of it as the fourth state of matter. So when we boil water and we heat it up, it turns into water vapor. That's something that we all do just boiling a pot of noodles on the stove. The same thing can happen with a gas. So that water vapor, if it's continuously heated to an extreme extent, the actual molecules and particles making up those molecules will separate. And we call that ionization. So that's when the electrons that are orbiting around the nucleus separate. And now there's no sort of bound atoms. It's all just charged particles that are floating around kind of in a soup. They're not, um, they're not paired up together anymore. It's less organized. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, great questions, thanks. So let's go back to this picture I had in the, one of the first slides, the solar wind. It is more plasma just being put out into our solar system. And it kind of inflates a bubble in the universe, in our little corner of the galaxy, that is the sphere of influence of the sun. So once you leave that bubble, you're not really being affected by the sun anymore. But that bubble is quite large and we call it the heliosphere. So inside the heliosphere, there is constant charged particles just blasting anything in its path. Of course, there will be more closer to the sun than further away. Uh, but these particles we can detect with instruments like Parker Solar Probe that um, Parker Solar Probe is known as the mission that can touch the sun. So it's uh, actually flies through the outer parts of the corona, and that's what we mean by it's touching the sun. But it detects these charged particles on a daily basis. And other instruments, even ones that have gone out to Jupiter, Saturn, and further, um, have seen these particles. Here's sort of an artist's conception of the heliosphere. So it's, you might wonder why it's in this sort of oblong oval shape. That's because the sun is moving through the galaxy and just like your hair gets pushed back when you are facing into the wind, the sun as it's moving through the galaxy has its heliosphere sort of blown behind it. Um, that's what's happening in this picture. But the other thing in this picture are two little satellites that are outside of the sun's influence. And has anybody here heard of the Voyager 1 and 2 spacecraft? Yeah, probably, maybe a lot of us, yeah. Maybe some not, that's okay. So Voyager 1 and 2 were launched in 1977 to um, take advantage of a really nice alignment of the planets. So they were able to fly past nearly every planet on their way out, take some good picture, do some good science. And then because they were going so fast after having passed by all the planets and gained energy from those planets' as gravity, um, they just continued flying out outside of the heliosphere. And now both of them are the only man-made objects outside of our solar system officially. 
And the reason we know that they left the heliosphere is that they also had these particle detecting instruments on them. And we saw for Voyager 2 in 2018, a noticeable drop, pretty dramatic drop in the amount of particles that were being detected, heliospheric particles, and the amount of cosmic rays that were detected went up. So now the Voyager spacecraft aren't in the heliosphere, they're in interstellar medium, which is the more or less, less dense uh, plasma that is just surrounding all the stars in our galaxy. So hopefully I've convinced you that the solar wind exists. Yes? So when we're driving a car and our hair is blowing, yeah. it's probably because we're traveling against or in uh, a gas. Yeah. So is the heliosphere created the way it looks because there's enough matter that the sun is blowing through that causes yeah. the same effect? Yeah. Similar effect. Yeah, so that would be the interstellar medium. Okay. So the interstellar medium is less dense than the heliosphere, but it's still enough material to kind of cause this effect of um, kind of blowback. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so was there a steep decline when the heliosphere ends um, as opposed to a gradual decay? Sure. Um, I think it goes back to what we were just talking about with the fact that it's traveling through another medium, there's kind of this dense wall right at the edge. You can think about it maybe as um, when an airplane breaks the speed of sound, uh, breaks the sound barrier, there's this hard wall of air that's being built up around whatever's trying to travel faster than sound until it does. Um, that sort of barrier is happening in, uh, by the heliosphere, and it's actually called the heliopause. So it's a pretty well-defined break. And that's why we see um, such a steep drop all, kind of all of a sudden. This was also, the scale of this is a whole year or nearly a whole year. So this was over the course of a couple weeks. Okay. Yep. What's the distance approximately? Of Voyager 1 and 2? Where the, to the helio boundary is. Oh, where the boundary is. Um, I don't actually have a good number for you. Um, that's something that I should look up. <laughs> it's pretty far. So you can see it. This it's many times the orbit of Pluto out here. Okay. Um, but this artist conception has the solar system all in this little area. Mm -hmm. So these are all the eight planets okay. plus the sort of hyper belt. It's just right in here. So that gives you an idea of the scale. Yeah. Um, is Voyager 1 and 2 still operating? Yeah, they still operate. So they're really far from Earth and they're not going to operate forever, but they're kind of on an energy conservation mode where they shut off for a lot of the time, they take a nap, and then every once in a while, Earth sends them a message and says, hey, wake up, let us know how you're doing. And it reports back basically the amount of particles it's seeing. I mean, I don't think it can do much more science than that at this point. Um, there's a lot of instruments that were more better suited to looking at planets, but this is still a really interesting area for a lot of scientists. So they try to keep it on as long as they can. They wake it up every once in a while. It takes around 16 hours for a message from Earth to reach one of the satellites at this point. So for context, the light we see from the sun takes eight minutes to reach our eyes. So if the sun turned purple right now, well, it's kind of set already, but if the sun turned purple at noon tomorrow, we wouldn't see it till 1208. <laughs> um, and that's kind of how um, light takes time to travel. And so our communication with Voyager takes time. Does that mean that the signals going back and forth are traveling at the speed of light? Yes. Wow. So going back to the electromagnetic spectrum, we use radio waves, which are another form of light to communicate. And this is exactly how all astronomers, all scientists communicate with satellites. So 
Um, it's, it's the same idea. And all of these waves travel at the speed of light. They all have different energies held within them, but they all travel at the same speed. Yeah, great questions. All right. So like I said, the solar wind can be harmful to electronics, to astronauts out in space. So when uh, we have this constant steady stream of plasma coming at objects in space, why don't they affect us? Why don't we know about this more? Why don't we worry about this more? Well, for the most part, Earth's atmosphere and Earth's magnetic field protect us from these charged particles. So maybe some of you have taken an intro to physics class. Maybe some of you have, haven't. But this equation right here is the Lorentz force law. And it basically tells us that any charged particle that's moving is going to be deflected by a magnetic field. That's B right here. So Earth's magnetic field deflects all of these moving charged particles away from us, and they never reach the surface of the Earth. Whereas a planet like Mercury that doesn't have as strong of a magnetic field, it doesn't have an atmosphere, it is constantly bombarded by these charged particles, and it actually starts decaying the surface of Mercury. So there are um, more effects going on there. Yeah? Don't some get through? It does not like meteors and... Like oh, okay, great. So meteors are actual rocks in space that they get partially through our atmosphere. Um, meteors burn up here in the mesosphere. So yes, there are things that get partially through Earth's atmosphere that don't get all the way down. These charged particles are what cause northern lights. So those particles actually do get in far enough to get close to the poles. And they cause um, the brightening of the atmosphere. Basically, the atmosphere is turning into a plasma where the where we see aurora. Um, and so they do get close, but they don't hit Earth necessarily. It's like shooting stars. Shooting stars, meteors, oh. rocks. So this is a good point. So the particles we're talking about, we can't really see with our eyes. Um, if we're just looking at one of them. But a meteor we could probably pick out, hold in our hand. Charged particles are electrons, protons. We can't hold them in our hands, but they do make up our hands. Um, okay, so the other, yeah. So when the aurora borealis is visible from someplace like the Canadian border, it means it's gone maybe in through some of those layers there. Yeah, yeah. So we're gonna we're building towards solar storms. Okay. And when you have a lot of solar wind, a lot of charged particles coming at once, they can get um, further down into the magnetic field and reach like closer down to the equator of the Earth. There have been a couple times in history that something like that happened. So we'll get there. The other piece of this slide is the electromagnetic spectrum and what passes through Earth's atmosphere. So there's two types of radiation the sun is putting out, charged particles and different forms of light, different wavelengths of light. Um, this is important to astronomers because we can't see the higher energy wavelengths of light from the surface of the Earth, which is good because we don't really want to be hit by x-rays and gamma rays all day long. It's not great for us. We, we do it at the doctor every once in a while, but we don't want to do it all the time. So. Earth's atmosphere is blocking those out, but there are ways we can still see them with satellites, et cetera. Um, the visible window is a window of light that makes it through Earth's atmosphere. And that's probably why our eyes evolved to see that certain wavelength of light or those certain coupled bandwidths of light. The other area of electromagnetic spectrum that passes through Earth's atmosphere is radio or a portion of the radio spectrum, which is why we have radio telescopes on the surface of the Earth. Not all radio instruments have to be in space to observe what they want to see. Okay, so it's not always a nice calm day with a steady light rain of charged particles in space. Sometimes the sun acts up a little bit. And this usually follows a cycle. There's an 11 year cycle of magnetic activity on the sun. So all of those charged particles in the plasma that make up the sun 
creates a magnetic field a lot like the Earth has. Uh, we have a north and a south pole on the sun and magnetic field lines connecting them and going around. The difference between the sun and the Earth is that the Earth has a solid outer surface, whereas the sun is just kind of plasma all the way down. So like I said earlier, it can behave a bit like a fluid. And that means that down at the equator, um, some of that plasma can move faster than it can at, sorry, slower than it can at the poles. And that causes this weird uh, stretching and twisting and tangling of magnetic field lines. And over time, those magnetic field lines get, get tangled so much, can actually snap and break. And this is what causes explosive events on the sun's surface. But before we get there, uh, you can see some of the effects of just tangled, twisted, knotted magnetic fields in just looking at the sun with a solar eclipse glasses. Once again, this is the photosphere, like I mentioned before, and we're seeing a couple of sunspots. So sunspots are showing areas on the sun where there's really intense magnetic field. You can think of that as like a clump of maybe knotted field lines. So again, magnetic fields deflect charged particles, which are what make up plasmas. And that means that a lot of the charged particles heating up the surface of the sun and making it glow orange cannot get to these areas, which is why they're darker. And we call them sunspots. Those are going to correspond to some of those other explosive events because they are in the areas where the magnetic field is the strongest. Um, sunspots are important to take note of for a lot of astronomers because they sort of give us an indication of where the sun is at in its solar cycle. So every 11 years, this twisting causes the actual, the poles to flip on the sun. So instead of having north at the top and south on the bottom, you could have south on top and north on the bottom. And that happens when the magnetic field is the strongest. So every 11 years, we see a lot of sunspots, a lot less sunspots, and a lot of sunspots, and a lot less sunspots. Right now is an exciting time because in we're heading into the next solar maximum, solar maximum 25, and it's going to happen around July 2025. And this is why solar physicists are sort of gearing up. There's You might hear a lot of news about solar instruments in the next few years. There's going to be a lot of activity, so it's a great time to study the sun. Yes. Did, did you say it reverse polarity every 11 years as part of that cycle then? The north and south pole is reverse. Okay. And is, yeah. it, is that continuity, that cycle, just due to basically the rotation of the sun then, and the fact that it's relatively stable? So every 11 years, it just stretches those field lines enough where they, they bust, I guess, or whatever. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That is what happens. Yeah. So the field lines are sort of following. Um, they're attracted to the poles. So you can just think of, you have two magnets. If you put them a certain way, they're attracted. If you put them the other way, they're, they repel each other. Um, so the magnetic field lines that are here getting twisted and bent are being attracted to the north or the south pole, whichever is opposite to them. And that means that over time, when you get a buildup, you're going to actually just flip the whole um, orientation of the magnetic field. Um, I don't understand that. Would south and north over time slowly rotate, or would they just at one point just swap? If that that was my first question when I learned about this too. It happens more suddenly, I think. Um, so it just goes. Yeah, kind of slowly, and then all at once. It's a slow buildup, and then all of a sudden it's aligned differently. Yeah. So like when you're taking off like an airplane, it goes slow, and then it's starting to fast, and then it goes. Yeah. Yeah. You can think about it like that. Do you have a question? Yeah. Okay. All right. So here we go. We're finally ready to talk about solar flares, which are the point when those twisted magnetic field lines actually snap apart. And this video is an example of one of the highest energy solar flares that has happened in recent decades. This was part of the Halloween 2003 solar storms. 
And what you saw that big flash, that was the solar flare happening on this, like in the chromosphere, right on top of the surface of the sun. And then there's all of this static right after that. That static is charged particles that were accelerated in the solar flare, sweeping out into space and hitting the instrument that caught that solar flare. So just like old TVs, uh, we saw static when there wasn't a good signal or there was a storm happening. The same thing happens to satellites in space. They get all staticky when there's a solar storm. There's a bunch of charged particles hitting them. Um, it kind of scrambles the signal a bit. Is that the real time scale? Is that real time? I think this is sped up. This could be over the period of several hours. Oh. Yeah. This is a portion of the sun. I mean, it's hard to. Yes. Hard to determine what portion it is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, great question. Yeah. So this is just the cutout of the surface of the sun. So we could have this flare happening sort of right here. Yeah. Kind of thing. Um, the scale of this is actually probably very large, um, but very large in the context of the sun is relative. So it probably wouldn't be bigger than an area this size. Yeah. Um, is it like, it, is it actually green or does that just mean? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so this is green because I think this was recorded by the Solar Observatory Extreme Ultraviolet Instrument. So we're seeing light that we wouldn't be able to see with our eyes, but the instrument recorded. And then the scientists who analyzed the data turned it into something that our eyes can see. So it's not actually green. We just make it green to distinguish the fact that it's in a different wavelength than visible light. Okay. So this is gonna be the most complicated diagram of the presentation, so bear with me. This is the quintessential image of the standard model of a solar flare. And what's happening is we see some field lines that, so it's a magnetic field line that is blowing and grabbing plasma from the surface of the sun and kind of pulling it up into an arch. And right at this point here is where magnetic field lines have snapped. And now there are different polarities. So one is a North Pole, one is a South Pole. And they're being, they're trying to reconnect because magnetic fields don't like to not have an, a con continuous sort of stream. So what happens is they get really close, like you're pushing two magnets that repel each other together until they get so compacted that they actually just flip into place. And that flip that happens really um, dramatically and kind of fast releases a bunch of energy. So that energy accelerates, again, the charged particles that make up the sun, and that in turn produces a lot of electromagnetic radiation. So we see light in a bunch of different wavelengths. We just saw it in ultraviolet in that video in this last slide. Um, but we also have particles that are going up into this sort of loop up here. So they're still kind of captured by the magnetic field, but they're very energetic. And they produce a lot of different wavelengths of light. Again, radio, um, ultraviolet, x-rays, gamma rays. Some of those particles get accelerated instead downward onto the sort of like arch of the solar flare. So here you can see some of these loops that I'm talking about. These are plasma loops that are tied to a magnetic field and pushing material from the sun into different areas. Um, so those charged particles that are in these loops get pushed downward really fast and they hit, they collide with the surface of the sun. And that produces lots of particularly X-rays and gamma rays. So this is where you're getting the most high energy radiation from a solar flare is right here at what we call the foot points of the flare. Any questions? What is a soft versus hard X-ray? Excellent question. So hard X-rays are the most high energy X-rays. So it's just, you're kind of subdividing the X-ray category into high energy, lower energy. 
Yep. Uh, what's the green versus blue on that diagram? Oh, what's so blue, green? they're showing um, electrons, and green, they're showing protons. And they're traveling on different paths. I, I think that's just part of the representation of the diagram. Um, however, I have an image later um, having to do with GRIP's mission that might actually have some reasoning behind that that we don't know yet. But to some extent, the electrons and protons do seem to be separated in the flare loop, but we don't really know why yet. Um, yeah, so further, the hard X-rays, a little bit lower energy than the gamma rays. Hard X-rays are mostly produced by electrons and gamma rays are mostly produced by ions, which are protons for all intents and purposes. Yes. And then the scale of that to rainbow with, with the with the earth, is the earth it's much that? Yeah. It right in the, middle of that thing? the yeah. earth would be a tiny little dot, okay. like on the edge of this foot point. Okay. Yeah. 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 It's kind of hard to grasp sometimes the, the bigness of the sun. Yeah. So what's an average height if there is such a thing like that? Uh, sure, yeah. So one thing that makes solar flares solar flares is that they happen in the chromosphere. So they happen pretty close to the surface of the sun in yeah. terms of the solar system, in terms of even the corona. They, they stay pretty close to the surface. But this could still be mm, several thousand to hundreds of thousands of kilometers. Up. Yeah. Yes. So the chromosphere, I, it's got these loops, uh, you know, following magnetic field lines of plasma, right? They want all over the place all the time, I guess. What I'm trying to differentiate is what a hot loop is. I mean, it's just it's one that's particularly energetic, um, you know, and, and enough so that it creates, you know, like you said, these big giant flares. I mean, what, what prompts all of that? Sure. Yeah. So this is labeled a hot loop. Um, I think it's really because you're closest to the sun, there's a lot of energy there, but it's also goes back to this part of the arch is producing the most soft x-rays or um, lower energy x-rays. And that goes back to black body radiation, thermal radiation. So yes, this part of the loop is mostly emitting based on temperature and it follows a specific function that is well known, um, the Planck function for those of you in the know. But um, yeah, so it's that is probably pointing out that this is a lot of thermal radiation as opposed to here the x-rays are caused by charged particles colliding with other particles and emitting light. But this is mostly just the heat. I mean, I've probably gotten distracted just because it's colored orange and all that. And what I'm really trying to understand is the, the big prominences when they do kick off and breaks these field lines, what generates those? Why do you get these things that all of a sudden flare up like that? What, what is it? Is there it's, it's a special event that happened right there? Yeah. They, they don't happen all the time. It's that breaking of field lines. So the plasma you see above the surface of the sun is usually following a field line. Um, if it's not, it has been following a field line that broke apart or something, and then it was kind of left there, and it's kind of propagating out. So beyond solar flares, sometimes solar, solar flares are associated with coronal mass ejections, which are similar processes that happen in the corona. So it's, again, it's magnetic reconnection. It's that explosive sort of reconnection of field lines, but it's happening in the solar atmosphere. And so now parts of the solar atmosphere are being heated up and pushed out into space toward planets like Earth. And this is where we start to see storms. So it's not always that nice, breezy uh, solar wind day. Sometimes there's a whole storm of extra high energy um, particles that are being spewed out um, toward us. And this is where they interact with Earth's magnetosphere, and they can actually, if they're of high enough strength, um, sort of 
penetrate deeper into Earth's magnetosphere enough so that they kind of get into this area here where satellites are orbiting, where um, they get closer into our atmosphere and they create aurora closer to the equator than is typical. And they can even start interacting with electronics on Earth, which can be a problem. But these um, intensities of coronal mass ejections are pretty rare. They happen once or twice a, a century. But they have happened on record. And that's what this slide is about. So the first time this was sort of recorded was the Carrington event in 1859. There wasn't a lot of electricity in 1859, but there were telegraphs. And during this solar storm, people were observing solar flares and um, they noticed there was big solar flares. And then the telegraphs started throwing out sparks or starting fires or shocking their operators. And they figured out that this was actually because of those solar flares that happened a day or two before. Um, in this particular event, there were aurora as far south as the tropics, so near the equator. Um, and they were super bright enough that I read some stories of people who actually just woke up in the middle of the night because they thought it was day, <laughs> but it was just aurora. Um, so if an event like that happened today, it would be a big problem because <laughs> we can hardly do anything today without touching something electronic. Our phones wouldn't work. Our power grid would be overloaded with energy because these are charged particles. They interact with our electric lines um, and they can cause, similar to what happens to the telegraphs, uh, fires, explosions. They can kind of destroy our infrastructure. Um, I want to take your question, but I don't want to leave it on too much of a doom, doing note. Just so, like, so the, the charge particles that got with the eggs during the current event, like, yeah. the one they were about to talk about, like, are those alpha, beta, like, what what flavor of particles would be making the stuff go down and to cause all that fire? Sure. Um, that's a great question. I myself don't know how to classify them in terms of alpha, beta. They are just the same electrons and um, protons, ions that make up the solar wind. Um, but beyond that, I don't have a good answer for you. <laughs> um, so not good if we're destroying our infrastructure, our electric power lines. This did happen in another event that wasn't as drastic as the Carrington event in 18, 1989, in which the Quebec power grid actually did fail. Um, there was damage done to the Quebec power grid. There was a couple other weird things that were noticed. Again, Northern Lights pretty far south, compass needles that were actually off course. So if you have a big event like this, airplanes are gonna start going in the wrong directions. Uh, satellites are gonna start giving weird signals. So this could be very impactful. But the good thing is we can actually prepare for it. Our bodies don't really care too much about these geomagnetic storms. It's not gonna hurt us. Um, what is gonna be hurt is the electronics and the power grid. So electrical engineers know how to deal with this kind of thing if they have advanced notice. They can set up ways to dissipate power and basically unplug things in anticipation of this happening. So the main takeaway is that we need to be able to predict solar flares so that we have enough notice that something like this is gonna happen. Because we might need more than a day to set that up. Um, so if we want to be able to predict solar flares better, we need to understand them better. We currently can't really predict when they're going to happen, just like the weatherman predicts a rainstorm. Um, so there's a lot more to learn, which is where GRIPS comes in. So GRIPS stands for the Gamma Ray Imager and Polar Emitter for Solar Flares. And it will launch on one of these hot student balloons that I showed in the first slide. Most of us, when we think of balloons, I mean, maybe you're thinking about, oh, I read in the New York Times last year about the Chinese <laughs> balloon that flew over the United States, weather balloons, party balloons. This is much, much bigger. It can hold an instrument that weighs a ton or two for almost a month, a couple weeks. So these balloons, you have to be careful where you launch them. But we launch them from places like Antarctica, where there's not a lot of population to get in the way of. 
Um, but there's other purposes for launching in Antarctica as well. For instance, in Antarctic summer, the sun never sets, which is our winter. Um, so that's great for an instrument that wants to look at the sun. So GRIPS will launch from Antarctica, similar to this picture here, um, to heights much, much higher than weather balloons and Chinese surveillance balloons. And so I kind of wanted to make the point that maybe we don't always reflect on why things even need to go to space in the first place. I mean, it's fun to launch, launch rockets, but why do we? Why does it need to happen? That's because of what I was talking about earlier, where our atmosphere blocks out certain wavelengths of light. And we want to study these wavelengths if we want to see those foot points of the flares. If you remember the standard model of the flare, we have bright X-ray and gamma ray sources at the foot points of a flare. So we can't see that from the surface of the Earth. They don't reach very far. But if we get a balloon up to the upper stratosphere, we'll be able to see those gamma rays. And further, even better, if you're out in space past all of Earth's atmosphere and you have a satellite, you're definitely going to be able to see these things. So that's why we launch satellites in the first place. We need to see things that we can't see from Earth. But then why are we using a balloon and not a rocket? Well, balloons are um, just a lot cheaper than launching <laughs> rockets. So NASA calls that lower risk because you have a lot less skin in the game. So balloons are a nice way for space projects to gain confidence and figure out all the kinks along the way um, to qualify their hardware, gain heritage as NASA would say, which all just means that this instrument that you're building is gaining experience. So it's been around the block a few times, you know that if you pay enough money to launch it out in space, it's gonna work. Um, and so balloons are a great way to kind of Get enough experience for your hardware that it's going to actually behave how you want it to. Yes. Is it helium? It is helium yeah. filling up these high altitude balloons. Yeah. And, and how high are you actually going with what? So are you going to get to that at some point? Um, I, I sh I'll just mention it right now. So Grips flew once previously in 2016. Um, unfortunately, it worked very well, which is not unfortunate. It worked. The instrument worked. The problem was the sun didn't have any intense solar flares during that period. So the energies that we were interested in looking at were not visible. They just didn't happen, uh, which is the problem with having a high altitude moon that can only be up a couple of weeks instead of um, a long couple of years, like a satellite. Um, but all that being said, the first scripts got to a stable orbit around 35, 30, 40 kilometers. Up. Um, so that's pretty that's pretty high stratosphere. A little bit higher. I read that um, weather balloons go, you know, lower stratosphere mostly. Yes. When you say stable orbit, so is there not like wind up there? It's complicated. Oh. Okay. Um, when Grips One launched, they had many preparations for launch and then they couldn't go and they had to get ready for launch again and then they couldn't go because what has to happen in Antarctica is the polar vortex has to be set up properly and I don't know much about this I haven't I wasn't there for GRIPS 1 so I imagine I'll learn about it <laughs> when uh, we get GRIPS 2 launch um, but yeah so the, the winds in Antarctica have to be set up such that when you launch a balloon it's calm enough that you'll get up to the height you want and then once you're at the height you want you will kind of be blown around Antarctica and not blown off on some weird path in some weird direction at too high of a speed. Um, yeah, it, it's complicated. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But like a totally different orbit than what we talk about when we talk about satellites. Yes, much lower. They're still in part of the atmosphere. They're below the mesosphere and the thermosphere. They're in the stratosphere. Um, whereas satellites are above all of that. Yeah. Question? Was there, a, uh, was there a descent plan and did you get it back? Oh yeah, great question. I have some pictures at the end of the presentation I can maybe show. Um, the There is a collection plan for most balloons that launch from Antarctica because they will crash onto the ice. Um, they're planned so they crash, nowhere it's gonna hurt anybody and it, um, 
if it's going somewhere toward a place of civilization, then it's sort of prevented by coming down early. But they do crash into the ice. The There's a pretty gnarly picture of Drips 1 um, that got smashed on its back end. Um, and because Grips had such a problem with the weather that year and waiting to launch and waiting to launch, they were very close to the end of the season where if you don't leave Antarctica before mid-February, you're going to be stuck there all winter because there's no planes in and out for the Antarctic winter. Um, so they actually had to leave Grips on the ice for a year. And all they were able to do was go grab the um, data drive. So there was some helicopter that flew out there. They just unscrewed a couple of bolts and grabbed the data and left all of the instrumentation, all of the very fancy uh, detectors on the ice. And fortunately, we're able to go get them a year later. Um, so a lot of that has been recovered and we're reusing it on GRIFS too. Um, some of the heavier metal was actually left on the ice, which isn't great, but it's Antarctica. Yeah, good questions. We're almost done. So this is a sort of a diagram of grips. I kind of just wanted to give you an idea of all the things that are on that picture from the first slide. I'm not going to go into too much detail of like how all the instruments work. We're really close to the end of our time. Um, but you can see that there's you know power generation, we have solar panels, there's a couple of other instruments that piggybacked. So these are the main grips instruments here and here. And then there were a couple other smaller instruments that were like, hey, we'd like to go to the stratosphere. We're just going to hop on. <laughs> um, so balloon missions are pretty fun that way. They're pretty flexible. Um, and they can do a lot of good science. All right, so the last science slide, um, why, what is GRIPS trying to look at? So this picture here. So there was a satellite called RESI that studied the sun for a couple decades and retired in 2018. And it actually just recently re-entered the atmosphere. So it's totally deorbited. It's kind of burned up in the atmosphere. Um, but before RESI did that, same flare that I showed you a video of earlier from 2003, RESI recorded the ions, the gamma rays, footprints, foot points, and the uh, hard x-ray, high energy x-ray foot points. And it noticed this separation between the cent like center spot of those foot points that isn't really well explained. Now, if you're looking at this, you might think, well, it looks pretty close. It's not so bad. But that separation on the sun is several thousand kilometers. It's enough to be significant. Um, so GRIPS wants to see this, but in much higher resolution than uh, RESI was able to do. So GRIPS's imaging instruments are much more sensitive to being able to resolve um, the difference between those two full points. Maybe it's too fuzzy and this is just fake. Maybe there's a lot going on there. So that's why we need more instruments like GRIPS to study these high energy um, emissions from solar flares. Uh, yeah, so the bottom line of all of this is that um, GRIPS's imaging will be able to kind of investigate more of what happens in solar flares, what is causing those particles to accelerate, and maybe eventually help us better predict solar flares in the future. All right, so keep an eye out. It's We're going into the solar maximum. Um, Take any opportunity you can get to look at the sun safely with eclipse glasses, solar telescopes, um, look for sunspots, and keep an ear out for any intense solar flares, because Grips would like to image them. 